Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is Monetization versus Independence. What's the best path? It's a special industry update with Mindy Diamond. I'm Jason Diamond, and this is the Diamond Podcast for Financial Advisors. At Diamond Consultants, our mission is to help advisors live their best business life. We want every elite advisor to find exactly the right place for their business and their clients to thrive, whether it's at a wirehouse, a regional, boutique, or independent firm. As the industry's leading recruiters and consultants, we've transitioned more than a quarter of a trillion dollars in assets under management in the past decade, and each year, 25% of transitioning advisors who manage a billion dollars or more are our clients. If you'd like to talk, please feel free to give us a call at 908-879-1002. Are you a financial advisor who's curious about whether you're in the best place to serve clients or if there might be a better way to optimize your business for the future? Should I stay or should I go? is a new book that serves as a self-guided journey, walking you through the key steps that Diamond Consultants takes with our advisor clients, whether considering change or not. Visit diamond-consultants.com slash the book to learn more. The prospect of becoming an independent business owner is one many advisors are attracted to. The freedom and control that comes with ownership, along with the potential of building equity, would seem like a compelling choice over transitioning to another employee model. Yet when it comes to deciding between monetizing by way of a recruiting deal now or making the leap to independence, many advisors find themselves caught in the middle. That is, they can have their proverbial bird in the hand now versus the potential down the road via increased growth, profitability, and even a sale of some or all of the business. Especially if you've never monetized, would it make sense to do so first before breaking away? Or should you just jump into independence head first with your sights set on the long term? There's not a simple one-size-fits-all answer, but there are definitely some guidelines to help you think through the decision-making process. Mindy and I are going to double-click into this topic, and it's an important one, so let's get to it. Mindy, thanks so much for joining me today. I'm thrilled to have you here. Yeah, of course. Great topic. Absolutely. So let's jump right in. I'd like to frame the conversation. So let me tee it up as follows. I'm an advisor who knows that ultimately I want to be independent, which is an increasingly common point of view. But I've never monetized the book before, meaning I've never taken a recruiting deal from a traditional firm. So the question is, and we'll dive into the specifics, but what is an advisor in that situation to do? So maybe I'll just ask you first, high level, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So I think it's a great question. And I think it comes down to if you ask 10 advisors, you'll probably get 10 different answers because it's an inside job. And what I mean by that is it has to start with what the advisors, the individual advisors true north is. What do they value most? What's most important to them? If it is most important to take chips off the table, to monetize the business in the short term, then there is not a chance in the world that going any version of independent, even one that pays some transition money, could make sense. But most advisors today are at least open to the idea of understanding what it means to go independent, how much money can I get up front, what could equity be worth, and what ultimately could the business be worth down the road. And the calculus is, if I ultimately want to be independent, does it make sense to go through two moves, put myself, my team, and my clients through two moves, meaning moving once to take a recruiting deal and ultimately going independent down the road, or do I rip off the Band-Aid and do it now instead of having to move twice? All right. So I'm going to put you on the spot here because something you just said got my wheels turning, which is around this idea that a lot of advisors or all advisors these days are curious about independence. So if you had to put numbers to it, if you work with 100 sophisticated wirehouse teams, what percentage of those teams are A, interested in talking about or learning about independence? And then what percentage ultimately actually make the leap to independence? Yeah, good question. And it's funny, I'm not a numbers person, but if I had to guess, I'm going to say 90% or more are curious about independence. 
they may not think they have entrepreneurial DNA. They may know that ultimately they're better suited going to another traditional firm, but everyone wants to understand it because the numbers are so compelling. And what I mean by the numbers is that the value of the business you build as an independent and what that business could be worth at the end of the day and the increased take-home economics blow anything else you could do as an employee out of the water. So most people want to at least understand it. But in terms of the percentage that actually do it, I'm going to say these days, if it's 30%, it's a lot. So I'll ask you, what do you agree with me and why do you think that is? So I completely agree on the 30% number. I think that's at least in the ballpark of correct. I was actually going to say 100% of wirehouse advisors or of employee advisors are at least curious about it. That's not to say that 100% of advisors will take a meeting even, but we certainly at least field the questions. And honestly, if an advisor doesn't ask those questions, I would insist that they get educated because it's too important and too legitimate of a space on the landscape these days. And that's where I want to pivot now is you started this business 30 years ago nearly, and most people didn't know what an RIA was, let alone this concept of an advisor leaving Morgan or Merrill to break away and start an independent business. But the space has been legitimized to such a degree that I think that's what enables us to even have this conversation. Can you weigh in on that? Yeah. So I'm smiling as you're asking me that because More than 15 years ago, Mark Sear and David Ho were advisors with Merrill Lynch, and they left to go independent and form Luminous Capital. I've been privileged to interview them. They Actually, I've interviewed them twice because they launched Luminous Capital as an independent when the whole industry thought that they had lost their minds. Like, Why would a top team who generated great revenue was making unbelievable money Uh, to not, if they were going to leave, not to take a transition deal from another firm and go fully independent. And then we interviewed them again when they sold their firm and went to First Republic. So really exciting stuff about them, but an unusual move 15 years ago. Here we are now in 2024. It's not only, it's not only not unusual to see a big team go independent, but it is highly legitimized, as you said. And I think what propelled that was the notion of the advisors beginning to really think about their business as a business. The notion that an advisor recognizes that even though they may have spent their life as an employee at a firm, they've built their business where they, that business has real value creation. And they essentially own the business, even though according to the letter of the law, the firm they work for does. And if they think about their business as a business, then the goal would also be to maximize its enterprise value. And it's hard to do that within a traditional firm. So totally agree. And I would actually take it a step further. I think we had a little bit of this perfect storm because on the one hand, you had advisor interest and change in thought process, thinking about the business as a business, a desire to monetize or maximize the value of the business in the long term. But in and of itself, that's probably not enough to shift the pendulum from the employee space towards the independent space. I think the piece we miss or that we have to layer on top of that is the notion that the independent landscape has proliferated and expanded so dramatically. And I'm not just talking about independent firms or broker dealers like LPL and Commonwealth. I'm talking about a whole array of support partners and outsourcing options that have made the idea of going independent more palatable and more realistic for a wirehouse team who's accustomed to that degree of support. Do you agree with that sentiment? I couldn't agree more for sure, but I'll take it one step further. So I'm going to say up until like probably three years ago, the pendulum swung so far to the right that it was rare to see a top team move from one traditional firm to another, that the idea of going independent had become so popular and so mainstream and so legitimized for all the reasons you just said because advisors wanted more autonomy and control because there were more options than ever before and because there were ways to really capitalize the business on the way in, which hadn't existed before that. But in the last three years, and I want to hear what you think about this, if you agree with me, we have seen the pendulum swing again the other way. And while still, again, we said probably 30% of the advisors we're talking to now wind up going some version of independence, 
it's become a little less frequent. What do you think about that? And why do you think that is? Yeah, it's interesting. So I would view it as, if you think about the old pendulum example, I think the pendulum is still swinging in that direction, but there is no question to your point, it is swinging slower. I think part of that, in fairness, stemmed a little bit from what we've started calling the regional banking crisis or the first republic crisis, where there was a little bit of this flight to quality or this flight to safety as a result. If you look at who were the winners of recruiting last year, a lot of the firms who won the largest teams in the industry, you think about the Rockefellers and Morgan Stanleys of the world that picked up some really meaningful seven, $10 million revenue teams. Part of that story was advisors that just couldn't get comfortable with the notion of independence, or maybe said another way, didn't think they could get their clients comfortable with the notion of independence. So definitely agree with the sentiment. I still think, to our point earlier, advisors are going to keep asking about this. And the space has become so legitimate that, to your point earlier, it certainly wouldn't raise eyebrows when somebody or it's not if, it's when these sophisticated teams go that direction. Yeah. And I'll share with you, literally an hour ago, I hung up with the the, the lead, senior leader of a very significant team. The team itself was probably generating about $25 million in annual revenue. They've grown exponentially, part because the team has grown and partly because of market conditions, but clearly thinking about the business as a business. Now, when most teams come to us, they talk a lot about, what's if I'm at UBS, what's life like at Morgan Stanley or what's life like at Merrill Lynch or vice versa? But it's rare to get a team that really knows some of the unique and newer players in the space, New Edge Capital, IEQ, Crescent, all firms we've had on this, all leaders of firms we've had on this podcast. But this team did. That in and of itself tells you how mainstream the notion of independence or quasi-independence in that case is, that that's a team that says, I don't want to build our own business. That's not appealing to us. But the notion of joining one that's already established, but in this sort of new world order. And maybe you could take a minute, Jason, and explain what we mean by new world order. Who are those firms? Yeah, I think what it boils down to is we used to talk about independence as a little bit of this holistic or blanket space. And in this new world order, there are many different flavors of independent, just like there's many different flavors, by the way, of captive firms, right? It's gone are the days when it's just the wirehouses. You have the regionals and the boutique firms. These days in the independent space, we see a similar dynamic. You have the independent broker dealers. You have the ability for an advisor to go out and start an RIA by themselves or with a support partner or join an RIA as an employee, whether that's a W-2 employee or join as a 1099 independent contractor. So there are so many different flavors of this today. The way I explain it in layman's terms is an advisor can keep control over any and all aspects that they want, and they can outsource any and all aspects that they want because the ecosystem born to support the independent advisor has expanded so much that's possible. It's really a matter of, can you dream it and can you make the economics work? So that's a good segue, I think. I want to talk now, remember through our initial query, which is primarily through the lens of an employee advisor. So let's say a wirehouse advisor who's never monetized before. So meaning they've never received a a significant transition deal from another firm. What are their options? And as I see it, they have four kind of paths. The first one of those paths, and let's talk through each one. The first one is that they could just decide They're better off foregoing the traditional firm recruiting deal and just ripping off the Band-Aid and go independent today. Tell me about the pros and cons of doing that. So an advisor saying, I've never monetized, but I don't care. I'm going independent now. The pro is that if you believe that going independent, being independent is soulful, then why delay soulfulness? Why delay joy? Why delay what you ultimately want to do? Why have to make more than one move? Why have to put your clients through it? Why leave chips on the table? Because theoretically, if you're going independent because you believe that you're going to, one, make better take-home economics, and two, ultimately build a business that has greater value for you than would that same business under or in a captive environment, then why delay the inevitable? Why waste a single day of building that kind of value or creating value? And what's interesting about that as a topic, the notion of going independent now, is we are seeing a whole wave of much younger advisors going independent. Like it used to be that people moved once to a traditional firm, 
got a deal, monetized the business once that is in the short term, and then moved again, say 10, 15 years later, whatever it was to go independent. But today we're seeing a whole host of younger advisors in their 30s and 40s that just are going right to independence. So what would you say the second choice is? Yeah, I think you already said it, which is what we would call the old school route of take the check today. And honestly, I view that option as probably a little more compelling than you're giving it credit for if you believe in the notion that the independent space isn't going anywhere. Because to my thinking, it's why not take the check today and then go independent 10 years down the road? Now, I think part of the answer to the question is, to your point, if ultimately where you're heading, why put your clients transitions and why not start building enterprise value as soon as possible? But talk to me about how do you view the option of take a check today from another traditional firm? So let's say go from Merrill to Morgan. And then with the intention down the line, I'll go independent. Yeah, because the truth of the matter is not everyone has a clear path to independence or not everyone knows 100% that's where they want to be. So they may look, that kind of advisor who may opt for that plan or that path is going to look at independence. He, want, he or she wants to get educated about what it means. He wants to understand what the economics were. She wants to understand what's involved and what the benefits and how you pitch it to clients. But ultimately, after doing that due diligence on independence, ultimately looks at the competitive firms. So if they're at Merrill, they look at Morgan and UBS and Wells and maybe even some regional firms and say, for now at least, that's better suited. The other thing I'll say is in that category, it's why firms like Rockefeller, for example, are doing so well. Because Rockefeller feels to a lot of folks like best of both worlds. What do you think we mean by that, Jason? It's interesting. When you talk to a wirehouse advisor, they don't complain about their technology or the menu of investment options available for the most part. So when we talk about the best of both worlds, what we really mean is what are the things that frustrate or limit advisors in the wirehouse world? It's typically things like compliance, business friendliness or lack thereof and culture. And so Rockefeller or a firm like Rockefeller, so a boutique firm with say 500 or 200 or 1,000 advisors instead of 15 or 20,000 can solve for a lot of that. Now, it doesn't solve for the business ownership, the 1099, the ability to create enterprise value, the ability to do M&A, right? There's still some things that I think it misses that the independent space does not. But if the primary motivation or rationale for the move is, I need to just get to a more business-friendly place, or you hear the place XYZ firm of old, right? It's the Merrill of old, or it's the Wells of old. Rockefeller, I absolutely think, check some of those boxes. And I'll give you another flavor of firms that might check those same boxes. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. My third option here is firms with multiple affiliation channels. So what we really mean by that is a firm that offers a W-2 employee channel, but also an independent channel. So Raymond James certainly fits that camp. Wells Fargo, Ameriprise, Stiefel. There's a lot of players in this space. What are your thoughts on those types of models? Yeah. So they are an awesome middle ground and it's a great point. If those firms as a whole fit the bill, meaning you've done your due diligence, you've looked on the hood, and you fall in love with those firms, then the notion of joining a firm where the firm recruits you as a W-2 employee and you get paid a big deal, whatever the top deal is that firm is offering at the time, and then have the ability to slide into their independent channel without having to change firms, without having to disrupt the business, that can be exceedingly compelling because, again, you've moved once, but you've accomplished two things at the same time. But let me ask you, what is the downside to the independent divisions of some of those firms? First and foremost, I agree with your thinking that these can be very compelling options that can solve for kind of both mandates. But I have two objections or two concerns about a move like this. First and foremost is it feels a little bit like you're already plotting your next move or plotting your exit before even digesting this one, or maybe said another way, like how do you really know that nine years from now, you're going to want to go independent via XYZ channel? I don't think you do. So to make your decision today based at least in part on that thinking, I think is probably putting too much weight in future uncertainty. But I think the better, more to your point or more to your question is a move like that, we're typically talking about broker-dealer versions of independence. So Raymond James, Wells Fargo, Finet, Ameriprise, the independent sides of those firms are independent broker-dealers. And in a lot of cases, that means you're still dealing with the exact same compliance as Wells Fargo's captive channel, as Raymond James's employee channel. So the thinking is, 
you may actually not be quite as independent as you think under some of those models. It certainly solves for the enterprise value creation because you, you become a business owner, but it may not solve for some of those other things that, for example, a move to the RIA space would. So with that kind of framework in mind, I want to get your thoughts on the fourth and final option, which is really no option at all, which is deciding to stay put, kick the can down the road and go independent, call it 10 years from now or closer to retirement. And I want to ask you this question, assuming that the advisor is being intentional about the decision, not just out of inertia, deciding to do nothing because they're overwhelmed or paralyzed. Somebody intentionally deciding, I'm going to stay put because ultimately I want to be independent, but I'm not there yet. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I think you nailed it. And it's funny because I was going to say the same thing. It's about intentionality. Staying put because it's easiest or you don't have the energy to do something that might be potentially better probably isn't the best reason to stay put. But staying put because you've done due diligence and you've educated yourself about what other options, whether it means moving to another traditional firm or actually going independent in whatever form means. And you've decided to one of two things. Either there wasn't enough meat on the bone elsewhere, meaning you didn't see an option that you felt was better enough, and or you really realize you probably aren't as happy, as unhappy as you thought you might be. It's more than good enough, and you're just not quite ready. You're not quite sold on getting there. And that if you, by default, make a move to another traditional firm, it's not going to ultimately solve for enough of what you want to. I mentioned the term better enough. What do we mean by that? I think it's a really eloquent way of saying that basically tie goes to the runner, that there's no question. I think almost any advisor, if they decided to conduct a really thorough soup to nuts due diligence process, they could probably find a firm that's marginally better than their current firm, or at least find attributes of a firm that is more than marginally better than their current firm, right? This firm has slightly better tech and that firm has a little bit more flexibility on the investment side. And this firm, I really like the culture and that firm over there has beautiful office space and a great branch manager. But the question is not, are there things that are marginally better? The question to your point is, are there th- or is there something out there that is better enough? And the enough part means better enough to justify the hassle of the move And the risk of the transition, both from putting your team through that and obviously also your clients through that. I want to turn this around a little because one of the things that gets overlooked in this conversation is if you're one advisor, it's probably not all that hard to think through this exercise, right? It's four pro and con type of options. I can do the analysis and decide what's right for me. But one of the side effects of all of the firms pushing teaming in a pretty major way, right? We see way more advisors on part of these mega teams these days, is that very infrequently is one advisor the decision maker. More often than not, we're talking about multiple decision makers, multiple partners. And that's where I think this calculus gets particularly hard and often honestly falls apart. So how does an advisor who's struggling with this because they aren't necessarily on the same page as their partner supposed to think about this? I know you speak with many advisors in that position. How would you counsel them to think about this? That's a great question. And it's the question of the day. So first and foremost, we always say that the greatest stress test of a is exploring other options because it's very hard. It's very challenging. And it's very, it's often unlikely that two, three, four, however many partners on a team all think the same way and all want the same thing, meaning they all have the same risk tolerance. They all have the same true north. They all are clear that they definitely don't want any transition money. They would never go to another major firm. They only want to go independent or the opposite. They only want to go to another traditional firm and they would never consider independence. In most cases, in many cases, when there are multiple stakeholders making a decision, it is hard and rare to find all stakeholders on the same page. So I think what you're asking is really, what do they do in that instance? And the instance is a couple of choices. Either they stay put by default because together, if they're committed to staying together, they couldn't find one single option that was better enough, or they wind up going to one or two of the stakeholders' first choice and the others sort of go along by default or just deal with it. 
And what I mean by that, so I'll give you an example to make it clearer. I worked with a team not long ago where two of the three partners wanted to go independent. And the third partner, who probably had more of a vote than the others, had, was a little older, more senior, closer to retirement, and had zero interest in independence. So despite how much the two other almost equal partners wanted it, they couldn't stay together and get to a place that everybody felt great about. They wound up going to Raymond James. Raymond James to them felt like a decent compromise and the right middle ground. So let me ask you, why do you imagine Raymond James would have been seen in that particular instance, given what I described as the ideal middle ground? Yeah, so certainly part of it could be this notion of multiple affiliation channels that we spoke about earlier. But I think that gets back probably more to, and I don't know the specific team you're referring to, but I think that probably gets more back to my previous point around the various different flavors of independence. So when you think through a team like that, where let's just take the really extreme example, one partner absolutely wants to, needs to be independent, and one partner, no way, no how, I only want to be at another wirehouse, right? The really extreme example in that situation, what's going to happen more often than not is, to your point, there has to be some form of compromise. So a lot of times, the right way to compromise is a firm like Raymond James's independent channel can actually be a great middle ground. Because what does it give you? It gives you a lot of the benefits we just described about independence. Freedom over how you spend your day and talk to clients and message clients. No bureaucracy or less bureaucracy. 1099 ownership of your business. Enterprise value creation. You own your equity. You own your data. So a lot of the the pros of independence, but with two important overlays. Number one, you get additional scaffolding and support because we're talking about Raymond James here, right? So anytime we're talking about a broker dealer chassis, there's more support. And then secondly, you get a brand. And independence is interesting because most advisors think of themselves as the brand, but there are scenarios like the one you're describing where the co-brand can make a lot of sense. So you can be an independent firm but you can put Raymond James on your business card and there's power in that and the ability to be able to represent that to clients. Is that kind of what you're thinking is on this as well? Yeah. And one other thing, everything you said is exactly right and went into the calculus, but I think what's implicit in talking about a senior advisor close to retirement, not wanting to go independent is the notion that advisor wants to monetize in the short run. The notion of being independent and having it taking five to seven years before it's break even or before it really begins to make economic sense was just unpalatable. So the notion of going to a Raymond James or anything like it as a middle ground meant they got some nice transition money and they got more freedom and control or a platform or a model that was more akin to independence. But let me ask you a question. If we think about the pros and cons of each path and some of the middle ground solutions, how does an advisor evaluate which of these options is right for them? Are there questions that you can ask yourself to determine the right next step? So I'd like to turn that around on you. You're speaking about Raymond James as a palatable kind of middle ground solution for the team you're referencing, in part because the independent channel of Raymond James offers some transition dollars not the same kind of life-changing money that a Morgan Stanley or a Rockefeller would pay, but plenty of independent options come with 40, 50, 60, even 100% of trailing 12 in transition dollars. And that can be a decision-making factor. But as I see it, what is exciting about the independent space today is there are many ways an advisor in the independent space might unlock capital or liquidity. Do you think that changes an advisor's calculus for which one of these options they might consider? In other words, An advisor who needed capital might have said, I need an independent broker dealer because they'll pay me a transition deal. But as I see it now, there's kind of other options that same advisor might pursue. Yeah. The notion of liquidity or options for liquidity is probably the thing that's made going independent or the independent space so incredibly dynamic and exciting in the last number of years. And what we're talking about here is not only multiple ways to get liquidity on the way in, meaning when you break away from being an employee to start an independent firm, but I think what you're asking me are ways for to monetize along the way as well. So it means two different answers. So on the one hand, it means that if an advisor wants to monetize to some degree on the path to independence, it used to be that the only way to do that was to go the broker deal, the independent broker dealer model. 
The problem, as you outlined before with the broker-dealer model, is that it can be limiting, a little more limiting than the than going full-blown RIA. And so I think what you're saying or what you're asking me is that with many different liquidity options and many different models of independence that are offering transition money or ways to capitalize on the way in, from getting a loan to taking on a minority investor to getting soft dollars from a custodian to models like platform firms like Sanctuary, for example, and LPL's private wealth services that offer significant transition dollars, there's lots of different ways to skin the cat. Yeah, I agree. And honestly, the reason I brought up the question is because I think without that context, it, we laid out these four paths. But without that context, an advisor might just think, I need to choose the option that solves for the economics piece the best, right? That most allows me to do what I need to do from a dollars and cents perspective. And I think it's an important point to make that transition deals are one component of that puzzle, but they needn't be. And in fact, they aren't and shouldn't be the only component of that puzzle. So I think it actually allows advisors to have some freedom to be able to say, I can make the decision that's best for my business. The transition capital can be an input into that, but there are other ways to unlock liquidity and access capital if needed. Fair? Yeah, totally. That's really spot on. And that really speaks to, we, you and I say this all the time to the advisors we counsel, it is a better time than ever to be an advisor. If you are an advisor that runs a successful, growing business, even if you work for the most restrictive firm, which typically comes in the form of have, working for a private bank or a firm like Goldman, where they're not part of protocol, they are, are restrictive garden leaves and the like, even in the most restrictive or captive environments, if you have built a business that business has real value... And there's so much optionality. You have so much agency about how you want to live your business life and to monetize the business and grow the business and expand the business and what services you want to offer. And again, you mentioned I'm at this 30 years. That's correct. In 30 years, I am blown away by how much more robust the ecosystems to support advisors, both at the traditional firms and outside of it is how many more capitalization or liquidity options there are, and just how much more control and agency an advisor has over his or her business life if they allow themselves to find it. I love how you just summarized that. I think that's spot on. And to use the term, allow yourself to find it. It's interesting because we talk often in terms of pushes and pulls. It feels to me like the pushes, so meaning factors that frustrate you or limit you at your current firm, are oftentimes why these conversations start, right? I can't tell you how many times we got a call from John because John was having a bad day. That's often how these conversations start. But I think what you'll find is that is not enough to old, because the bad day is going to end. The tensions are going to calm down. And whatever that frustration was is eventually going to go away. It's not enough in and of itself to have these push factors. There also needs to be a pull or a draw to something. And a lot of times that is, I think, what advisors rely on, just like almost like an intuition to help with this calculus is what feels soulful to me as I think through my next chapter in terms of, is it another independent option or is it another captive or traditional firm? Yep. I couldn't agree more. And that's the answer. There is more choice than ever before. And in choice lies agency and excitement and wonderful things ahead. Not to be cheesy, but that really is the truth. Yep. So let me ask you one final question here to just tie a bow on this. Is one of these paths by definition better than the others? Or do you genuinely view this as that's what makes a horse race and depends on the advisor? Oh, I genuinely view it as that's what makes a horse race. It isn't even a little bit up to us. When we advisors ask us all the time, what do you think the best option for me is? And I say, I can tell you the pros and cons of every option. I might even put a thumb on the scale sometimes and tell you what I might do in that situation or tell you what others have done in that situation. But any third party that suggests to you that they know what's best for you, better than you do, I'd run for the hills. But with that said, it's an inside job. And as long as the advisor is clear about what their true north is, their goals, what's most important to them, 
That is all that matters. And for some, that means going to another wirehouse. For others, it means going to a regional firm. For others, it means going to independent, but to a broker dealer. Others, it's build your own RIA. Others, it's a supported independent model. And there isn't a right or wrong by any means. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Totally agree. And I'm excited to have you back on because what, what I think is also exciting is this calculus is changing by the day. There are new firms, new models, new options for advisors quite literally every single day. So we'll have to get you back on to revisit this topic once there's a fifth path that we can talk about. I love it. I'm in. Absolutely. Thanks again for joining, Mindy. This was a blast. You bet. As a financial advisor, you hold yourself to the highest standards of integrity, honesty, and credibility. You are successful because you take your professional responsibilities seriously and are dedicated to your clients. But are you living your best business life? Are your goals aligned with your firms or could a better option exist? Should I Stay or Should I Go is a book written with you in mind. It's a self-guided journey that walks you through the key steps that we take with our advisor clients. This strategic thought process and roadmap to professional self-discovery is designed to help you ask the right questions and think critically and objectively, whether you're considering change or not. Learn how to get your copy at diamond-consultants.com slash the book.